The first reading has the story of this battle with the Amalekites. These were descended from Esau. Esau and Jacob, even though they were twins, were going to be fountainheads of very different tribes. And we have here this emblem of the praying church in practice often applied to the contemplative element in the church. The hands of Moses are held up in a very dramatic way. Remember that the position of the orante is that of these extended hands. We find them also in the catacombs and the priest has something of that still in the canon of the laws. Well, these hands are the praying hands of the church. It's an interesting story, actually. Joshua did as Moses told him and marched out to engage Amalek. So we have here the active life. We have hand-to-hand -hand combat. We have front-line engagement with the enemy. The bull Umbratilem of Pius XI was given to the Carthusians, indicating that without the contemplative life of the orante, of the praying, of the supplicating church, those engaged in active combat, those in mission lands, in missionary work throughout the church, will reap meagre fruit. Umbratilem means the hidden, the shaded life. So there is a hidden army of orantes, of praying ones, that the world doesn't see. And these are at the heart of the church. Dans le cœur de l'église, ma mère, je serai l'amour cried out Thérèse of Lisieux, in the heart of my mother the church, I shall be love. And she saw well how her vocation contained all the others, and that she had an impact over the missionaries, over the missions, over the mission lands, where her part of her heart at least seemed to be orientated. She nearly was actually transplanted to a mission because the Carmelites were founding a lot in those days, and there was a question of her going at one stage. It is not for no reason that she is co-patron of the missions, along with the great active missionary Francis Saviour, one of the first Jesuits. So, here we have the fact that what differentiates the life of specifically the Catholic Church from those of, for instance, our separate brethren in the West is that we have this element of purely gratuitous praise going on day and night. It is important and it mustn't be lost. But even in the individual soul there must be the balance. It's no use just being fully switched on really all the time in nothing but the external. Otherwise, what have we to give? There has to be a blend, and only in union and quiet union with Jesus can we really be fully effective. Otherwise we may end up making a lot of noise for Jesus, but not, allow, not allowing Jesus himself to speak. For we ourselves cannot hear him, and therefore haven't his word, but only our own, to hand on. So... Moses' arms grew heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and on this he sat, Aaron and Hur supporting his arms, one on one side, one on the other, and his arms remained firm till sunset. And if the story is read in full, we see how when his arms grew weary, Joshua was losing the battle, and when he was holding them up, and therefore praying away, he was winning. It makes us think of the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, 
from which we get the Feast of the Holy Rosary on the 7th of October, this very month. In fact, St. Pius V, I believe, saw in vision or somehow in some kind of knowledge that the, vict the victory was being won and had been won. Remember, news took a long time to travel in those days. But it was in reply to precisely the praying arm of the Church, in that case specifically the Rosary. It happened again in Vienna in 1683 and again in Belgrade in 1716. Prayer is answered and these were battles which changed European history. And so we do well to praise the Lord for his victory over our spiritual enemies. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. A prayer which comes often in the church's liturgy as a response. This is the second of the gradual psalms. They were going up to Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem, it means actually going up, because if one goes to the Holy Land, one has to climb, has to go up to Jerusalem, and further still, then up the hill of Sion, so they would see this glorious vision. Jerusalem is vision of peace, and so they would have a vision. Wow, we've got there after all the sweat of travel. And then, of course, the hill of Sion again, shrouded in glory and protected by the Lord. And under there, David lies, it would seem. Now, we watch here through the eyes of the pilgrim, and indeed we are pilgrims. All that we do in this world is towards glory, and therefore we must not get bogged down on the pilgrimage, but keep our eye fixed on the Jerusalem. There are no pockets in a shroud, and if we go around looking all the time from left to right, interested in all possible distractions, we will not go in a straight line. Our life is a pilgrimage. Indeed, the word parish comes from paroikia. Now, oikia, the root of dwelling, and par, on the way, it, they are stopping places on the way unto glory precisely. And all the saints go in the same direction. We have in St. Paul's teaching for Timothy something that we can take with us. Timothy had a Greek mother and grandmother. It would seem that to give him access to the Jewish brethren St. Paul felt the need to give him the right of circumcision, which then gave him, as it were, the passport of access. He was able, therefore, to act both on the Hellenists and on the Hebrews and have a greater impact. But he never loses that side of his roots. And here, when St. Paul talks about the Scriptures, he is referring to, remember, not the New Testament, but what is there in existence, the Pentateuch, prophets, the writings. But probably, in the case of Timothy, they are coming to him in Greek translation, Septuagint, which actually is the basis of many of our quotations in the New Testament. We find that St. Paul is quoting in Greek from the version known. But he does point out that all scripture is given by divine inspiration. All scripture is is divinely inspired. It's one word in Greek. And profitable for teaching, correction, and remission. Much fruit can be gained from one verse, whereas whole paragraphs can have little fruit if the recipient is not in mode of begging of hungering, of thirsting, of waiting, of attending. This Sunday will be canonized a great listener of the word, Blessed Elizabeth of the Trinity, a young Carmelite. She died at 26 at Dijon. And she had a great 
interior life. Indeed, that's why she's been canonized, because she gave that to the Church, a whole body of doctrine regarding the inhabitation of the Blessed Trinity in the soul. Hence her name, Elizabeth of the Trinity. And she was a Beth, El, a house of God, Elizabeth. And she was somebody who was very much aware of the way in which in this life the soul can be all attentive to the one inside. Now, this person was somebody who is figured as just another Mary seated at the feet of the great master and looking into his eyes. It's the position of the soul awaiting just one crumb of teaching. And so in Lexio Divina, if that is the mode, the word will have an impact. And one word will go a long way. Lexio Divina is not for quantity, but for quality. It's not head knowledge, it's heart knowledge. And so one asks the Holy Spirit, as the priest invokes the Holy Spirit, the Epiclesis at Mass, placing his hands over the offerings, so too we ask the Holy Spirit to breathe over the word. And then the word is opened. And he gives us a word. And then one goes on until one is warmed by a word. And then one stops. One doesn't carry on once warmed. One stays with the word and then goes into prayer mode, contemplation. Remember that the old scala, the old scala contemplationis, the scale, the ladder of contemplation, goes in this order. Lectio. Meditatio. Oratio. Contemplatio. They were actually written on the stained glass windows in the scriptorium of La Trappe. There, where precisely in the hours of night the Nexu Divina would take place. And one goes from the word into contact, the ultimate being contemplatio. Let's not then just stay with the Lexio but go on to the divine part of it, Lexio Divina. As regards the Gospel, if one translates literally, one has even a stronger translation than one has here in the toned-down Jerusalem version. The word is... She keeps pestering me. So, maybe I have neither fear of God nor respect for man, but since she keeps pestering me, I must give this widow her just rights, or she will persist in coming and worry me to death. It is a dynamic equivalence, that last bit there. But the actual Greek would have even a stronger dynamic equivalence if it were translated something like this. This woman's going to give me a black eye. Because actually the word kolafus comes into it. She's going to administer bashings unto me. Punches. So, interesting that the Lord actually uses very direct language. He is, remember, a Hebrew and he uses Hebrew idiom and the Semitic tone is always concrete. We tone it down in translation. It's always the case in the Bible. Whereas the Hebrew sometimes makes one's hair stand on end. Interesting how the Gospel takes on the culture and the tone of the area. And as indeed the teaching of the Church insists there has to be that inculturation and if one does not respect the culture that one is entering one cannot hope to conquer it one permeates and understands and respects and then raises up and elevates what is usable therein not going to produce clones of ourselves from where we're coming from there's always good in a culture that can be exploited but if there's no respect, only invasion, 
what can we hope to gain? We cannot hope to command respect unless we give it first. It applies in all sectors of life. And so the Lord is inviting us to be insistent in our prayer. He goes on, You notice what the unjust judge has to say. Now, will not God see justice done to his chosen? Here the word chosen in the old translation would be elect. In the root of chosen, out of, a ligere, which is also a theological theme in itself, the question of election. It's exploited excessively, actually, by the Calvinists. They go overboard. But it's something that we never fully understand on this side of time. The Lord seems to choose, doesn't he? We see it in the Gospel. And then even in the circle of the Twelve, we have those three who are, as it were, specially chosen for intimacy. So the mystery of the Lord's choice is strange. But we are called to be chosen. The Lord offers generously an invitation to intimacy. We are free to say yes or no, but we can't appropriate it under our own terms. If we want the Lord's friendship, we do so under his conditions. And therefore we make time for our best friend. We can't enjoy the Lord's blessing just by switching him on and off like a tap or putting him in our pocket and taking him out when we want him. The consolations of the Lord come gratuitously and they cannot be sought after. Actually, they come accidentally when we're lost, when we're not actually expecting them or looking for them. But the conditions we can provide, and they are essentially submission to the divine will perceived. Without that, the spiritual life is our own thing. I conclude. He does go on. If this is the case, what of the question of the persistence of the elect in their prayer? I quote here from the translation, Now will not God see justice done to his chosen, who cry to him day and night, even when he delays to help them? I promise you, he will see justice done to them, and done speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now, just one phrase from here we can take with us. It's this. His chosen who cry to him day and night. This, again, goes back to when I started the praying church, orante. The church who day and night, now and night, is in prayer mode, in impetration mode, in supplication mode. And this night prayer is important. Hence it is, as I started, I returned to that question of the contemplative life in which, by now, many lay people have a part through night adoration. If we cannot sleep at night, it is important. Some privileged souls find that they are being woken regularly at three o'clock at night. It could be their guardian angel nudging them, because at three o'clock at night, satanic rites happen. They have their hour of unmercy, and many things go wrong at night. People get depressed and suicidal, and they're alone. Great sins happen under the moon rather than under the light of the sun. All this is matter for reparation and impetration. And it's important also that if we're engaged in the Lord's service, we be aware ourselves of the importance of the early rise, the virgin moments of pre-dawn. That's where Lectio Divina happens classically in the monastic life. It goes back centuries. And the monastic authors know the advantage of the silence of nature. When there's not a voice, not a chirp, all is still and all awaits one still, small voice. <laughs>